Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Smart City Podcast. Today, my guest is Nikolai Koster. Head of Mobility at Dean. Welcome, Nikolai. Thank you, Jim. Well, it's great to have you. Uh, you've had uh, quite a broad career in the uh, transportation and mobility industry. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your current organization? Absolutely. Yeah, my name is Nikolai, and uh, I'm Danish, by the way. I've been in the U.S. for five years. And with Deem, uh, my uh, current workplace for about a year and a half. Um, and before that, that's what sort of led me here was um, first about seven years uh, co-founding two uh, mobility tech startups. And I then had a stint, a company called Carhu, uh, which is um, as part of uh, Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi's mobility efforts. And, uh, and then I joined Dean to um, head our uh, new mobility line of business. Great. Well, you know, today, um, you know, we invited you, you on to talk about sustainability and transportation and in particular you know, impacts on congestion, pollution um, and traffic and uh, transit time. Um, I mean, how do you describe the current transportation situation? <laughs> uh, not good. <laughs> um... I mean, this can this can go many ways. I, I first, maybe just for context, I just want to say, if you, I don't know how many of the folks listening to this call have actually been to Denmark, but that's a very uh, bicycle-heavy country, and it's a very public transportation country. So interestingly enough, I actually didn't own a vehicle until I moved to San Francisco uh, a year and a half ago. I want to say a proper vehicle until I moved to San Francisco a year and a half ago. And I'm even considering if one vehicle is enough for our little family here to actually move around. Um, so with that sort of in mind, that context in mind, I think for me, it's been, it's been, um, obvious. I want to say that, um, just from the, the, the work that I've done and, and from what I see the work that other people do, what people do, um, some of the main problems we have in the world is the reliance, uh, the transportation problems we have in the world is the reliance on private car ownership. Um, so, you know, depending on how you count it something like 1.4 billion cars in the world right now. And I think it's plus 80% of all transportation in the world takes place in a private owned vehicle. Um, and that, that just, I think a lot of listeners probably on this, this podcast know a lot of these sort of uh, stats that sort of us mobility folks sort of rattle off, but it's, it's the issues around uh, congestion in cities because today cities are really built for cars, not so much for pedestrians anymore. Um, the cars are parked most of the time. They're actually not utilized that much. Um, cars are not safe. Humans are not particularly great at driving an automotive vehicle safely, et cetera, et cetera. So um, for me, yeah, private car ownership is a big problem. Let's, let's drill down a little bit in, into that. How, how did you come to this industry and what is transportation like, you know, in in um, Denmark versus, say, San Francisco, and and, and give us particulars. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think if you if you <laughs> when you Google Copenhagen, which is the capital of Denmark, and you sort of uh, you'll see so many pictures of people on people on bikes, the same way that you do in in the Netherlands, uh, in Amsterdam, and so on. You see all politicians coming into the parliament on their bikes. Um, and obviously here in California, this is such a this is such a car heavy country. This is how we move around here and. Um, uh, we have great public transportation in 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 Denmark. It's not just in Denmark. There are many countries in the world that have uh, great public transportation. Here in um, San Francisco, not so much. Uh, we drove our car back from Los Angeles last night. Being three days in Los Angeles, there's no, there's almost no way you can move around um, efficiently in public transportation. It doesn't really, it's not, it's not as great there. 
That's that's interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking about my time in Copenhagen, and actually once I took a a, a hovercraft over to Malmo. Did uh, you years ago? Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so you know, so what are you know what does the future look like? Where wh- what are the complications that you see for for the world and moving from this car based system? to something else yeah let's 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 try to unpack that a bit so to me without being too sort of tech loving futurist uh, naive but i am uh, if to me it's if we take a timeline and we look far enough out into the future i think it's clear with the sort of a sort of ai advancements around uh, perception planning um, electric vehicles. So the combination of an electric car with a car that can drive itself, that is a, that that's something that will be deployed across the world at some state in the future. And then I think the question then is, how do we advance that? How do we get there quicker with the advantages that this will have for sort of people and planet? And I think equally important, how do we make sure that it's deployed in a way where it doesn't cause bigger problems than it was meant to solve. And what I mean by that is we kind of can't have, you know, ride hailing companies dumping 25,000 robo taxis into Manhattan and sort of, and we think that that's going to solve Manhattan traffic problems. It's only going to make them worse. So to me, sort of the question mark and the interesting thing is how do we make sure that these, the public transportation systems are made better and how, the public transportation systems that we know today, how do we get them to work in a close collaboration with these private operators of uh, new mobility modes, which again, to me, the the absolute main piece of that is sort of uh, robo-taxi fleets. Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, let me ask you, Nikolai, uh, you know, while while it sounds uh, very rosy, there are some um there's always the unintended consequence or consequences that do occur and i think all of us probably have seen the um the extrapolations that if an autonomous shuttle bus or robo taxi is is so cost effective that there may be a multitude of them circling your block in manhattan and you may have incredible amounts of traffic of empty vehicles just waiting to pick up the next passenger. Yeah. Um, how do we eliminate or alleviate those kinds of complications? I think that's a great question. And I think first and foremost, if we look at how uh, ride hail, but even also sort of lately micromobility, specifically e-scooters have been deployed, especially in the US, which has a much more free for all approach to um, business in general, right? Um, it's be, it's really been sort of a let's roll, roll into a city and and um, and then we'll we'll sort of we'll apologize later if if the intention of how we roll out these systems uh, if if it didn't work out as sort of intended, whereas what we've seen in Europe uh, with regards to rolling out either ride hail or micro mobility that has to be done in in, in close collaboration with the legislators, uh, the transit agencies and so on, which then to my point, we can have your example and that has to be legislated. So the same way that you and I, Jim, we can't just, you know, <laughs> we wanted to start a new sort of airline type service. We wouldn't just be able to deploy 10 whatever type of planes up into the sky next Monday. Um, that would, we, there, there's legislation around that, but we actually haven't had that in the transportation space on the ground. That's been a free fall. So I think it's very clear that uh, robo, it, it, operating a robo taxi in the city, whether it's uh, in New York City, in Manhattan, or anywhere else in the world, is a has to be done on a sort of invitation basis, and it has to be in a way where whether you have two operators or five operators. Um, that has to be done. That that data has to be shared between them. It has to be aggregated on a level for the um, sort of master operator in the city, if you will, which is really the transit agency. And then you have to look at all the data, the transit, the patterns, the occupation, as you were sort of saying, the occupation rates, the dead mileage, how often are these, you know, uh, pods of vehicles or shuttles, how often are they empty, where do they go, um, are they even allowed to roam around empty or do they have to pull away, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And I could even extrapolate further that it's not just a single fleet 
uh, of of homogenous uh, automated shuttles. But you know, today if we look at some of the transportation scheduling services, where you know it shows us we could we could walk and then take a bus and go to light rail and maybe rent an Uber yeah. and get to yeah. our destination. It's only going to get more complex when the when the scooter, the autonomous shuttle, competing versions of autonomous shuttles are are available, and many of these these uh, transportation management system platforms have access to different um, not only different modes of transportation but have different business cases. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some may want to sell you advertising, some may want to sell you coffee on the shuttle bus. Um, it's going to be a a very rich mix of of options. Absolutely, and I, yeah, I wanted to comment on that for a second. So first of all, I think the future of mobility, how we solve transportation, both for folks living in cities, folks visiting cities, but also for the city, the livability of the city and the planet as, on an aggregate. We can't have, uh, but first of all, we need all the modes, whatever that means. That sort of differs between cities, but it's all the way from, you know, sort of walking or the subway or the train or some type of vehicle moving back and forth with you on the, in the back seat or the front seat, um, the right tool for the right job. Um, but what we can't have is we can't have individual operators only optimizing within a vacuum. So you can't have well, I'm not saying can't have, I'm just saying like the ideal type of setup is that, um, so, if, you know, again, take the example of Manhattan. If you and I, Jim, are standing on where I used to live in Alphabet City um, downtown, okay. and we're on Avenue A and 13th, you have right now a couple of ride hail companies operating in Manhattan. And we pull out an app, just one single app, and we summon a vehicle, and then that comes, let's say the ETA for that is six minutes away. Maybe a competitor had a vehicle that was two minutes away. Now we're dragging a car an additional four minutes, right? That they that wouldn't have to do. So I think I think for me the best the or the way that we have to do this if we want to optimize for the city, not optimize for the operator. If we want to optimize for the city, the best possible traffic patterns, you kind of you start looking at something that's really sort of an aggregate way of operating these systems together. You kind of need to have one almost like a master API that everyone taps into. Um, and, and, and I know this sort of goes against sort of the, the I guess, like the capitalism and the way that, because they need to make money, right? They need to be distinct businesses and sort of optimize their own thing. But at the end of the day, if, if some of the bigger whys that we're trying to solve is not profitability for uh, operators, but it's uh, livability for folks that live in the city, it's the safety of the pedestrians, it's also the safety of the drivers on the streets, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that's the way it probably needs to go. Yeah, I mean, taking one more step in in that continuum is it, there There will be vehicles that are not just people, uh, transport transportation vehicles. Um, you know, your your pizza will be arriving, arriving right. a, a, little, a little thing or, um, and there'll be an awful lot of those. Um, you know, as well, it'll be it certainly will be will be interesting. I do know yeah. that um, for those that are concerned about the big brother and, and data collection aspects, there are a number of initiatives out there in the world that are using blockchain uh, technologies so that you you as a transportation potential user can anonymously broadcast your trip, um, your past trip history along with your uh, projected trip today and different transportation providers could then bid on your trip today knowing your past history um absolutely on this way um you know maybe some approach like that would uh you know may, may gain traction too yeah i think there is definitely some i like i love that uh, there's some nirvana of um some type of marketplace connecting tissue in the middle, you know, kind of hopefully decentralized on a blockchain that allows everyone that wants to move or anything that wants to move. So it's either me or you or the pizza with all on the other side of the marketplace with all the participating modes from feet to flight, if you will, which we call it. And then the end and then per mode, the amount of operators either public 
city or private. It's kind of probably the framework. Mm -hmm. I, I agreed. Um, well, that, that's been a pretty good um, discussion on autonomous vehicles or on and robo taxis. Uh, but I, but our, our our title today is sustainability and transportation, and, and sure enough, I, autonomous vehicles play a role there. But it's larger than than that. The first one that really comes to mind for me and, and many is is the you know pollution aspect of um, you know many transportation enhancements will be electrified and there will be less CO2 emissions. Um, mm -hmm. And you know some some of the un positive unintended consequences are you know if we have a connected vehicle, even if it's a carbon, even even if it's a CO2 emitting vehicle, and it is uh, a connected vehicle that is communicating with a traffic signal, the traffic signal may stay green a little longer and let that vehicle pass, so right. that so that there isn't a you know a concentration of CO2 right there at the corner where the pedestrians are. And it may, you know, may increase the um, you know, gas mileage for, for that vehicle. So it's it's not really, in my mind, simply about electrification, but some of just um, a little smarter application of the legacy technology as well. I mean, I think you definitely have a point. I think the reason why I like we like talking about robo taxis is that it puts a nice flag on the moon. It gives folks a really good sort of this is what success looks like. Again, with the asterisk that this is deployed in a very sort of uh, thoughtful way. Again, it can destroy traffic in cities as much as it can alleviate it. Um, it's just to give you a sort of a data point, you probably you might have read the report. OECD came out. It's, it's a bunch of years ago now. They did a sort of simulation model on an average European city, but you can apply that across the world. Average European city, by the way, is quite small. I think it's something like can't remember 250,000 people or half a million maybe, but it's less than a million people. And they said, let's take the traffic, sorry, the, the, the movement patterns of folks in the city. So how do they commute in? How do they commute out? And what do they do while they're in the city and on the weekends and so on? So that's the need of citizens in the city to move around. How do they do it right now? They largely do it in private owned vehicles. What if we deployed uh, robo taxis and shared robo taxis, meaning you are forced to sit next to someone you don't know, like you do in restaurants. Um, if you deploy that, what would that new future state look like? And provided you preserve the existing public transportation uh, infrastructure that's there already. And it turns out you can remove 90% of all the vehicles in the city and toss them, and you're left with 10%, which are now shuttles. Uh, uh, operated like robo taxis. When you sort of put uh, that out, uh, uh, Nikolai, nine, ninety percent. Who yeah. who uh, who has calculated that? Uh, OECD, so the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They did the model on Lisbon in Portugal. That's fascinating. It is super fascinating, and I want to. So they have. Um, so the you can find it on the internet. I can send it to you afterwards, and you can link to it in the description if you want to see it. So. Um, they basically commissioned uh, this simulation to try to again play out how this would work. I think again, to, I think two key points in this is preserving existing well-functioning public transportation. This is in Lisbon and Portugal. It's in Europe, so public transportation is pretty good. It also is not single passenger rides, so it's not Nikolai or Jim going into a very large fancy black car, but but in a robo taxi version. These are small uh, shuttle bus type setups where we're you know, three, four, five, it's kind of basically in a high occupancy vehicle uh, that operates at all times. It's 24 seven, obviously it never sleeps, um, uh, you know, it goes to charge quickly by itself and then it comes back into the fleet. Um, one of the other interesting data points was that um, with now no cars in the city, no private owned cars in the city anymore, um, there's no need for parking. So this average city, you could remove or will or you basically free up what equates to uh, about 200 soccer fields worth of parking that you can then convert into whatever you want you know the city could sort of open that up for new sort of economic development it could be for restaurants cafes businesses you can do, you can, you can do parks you can do schools whatever you kind of want there well certainly you know one one aspect of sustainability is quality of life and uh you know i happen to live in the in the southeast actually in south florida and there are a number of uh legacy historical tourist type cities that 
are beginning the process to ban cars from downtown and have you know, shuttle golf carts. Currently, they're driven by humans, but the long-term plan is to really have a, um, an, uh, you know, out of the historic ring of the city, some uh, depot where you can board that shuttle bus and ride, you know, ride into the historical downtown district. Um, and frankly, it, it, it does, in fact, in, increase that quality of life. Um, you know, another part of that of that human factor of quality of life is just is purely safety. And right. you know, there, there still are a tremendous number of, of traffic accidents, um, fatalities and, and injuries. And uh, Nicola, as, as you undoubtedly know, they, they, they actually have been increasing um, since we've had the impact of COVID uh, for uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, some of it is people are driving faster because the roads were, were were a little bit less less cluttered with with other cars, but um, the curious aspect is they actually have been rising. And as as we all know, most of the well, the great majority of accidents are happening because of driver human error, not because of the fault of the vehicle itself. Exactly, and some ninety four percent of all car accidents happen because of um, human human error. And um, it, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Again, we're talking about this future state. We're we're, <laughs> we're talking about this, the flag on the moon still, right? It's it's that future state where um, humans don't have to drive anymore. I'm sure we'll want to drive once in a while. We'll want to uh, bring out some old beautiful Corvette Stingray and go for a ride along Pacific Coast Highway. But uh, if we think about transportation as in 99% of transportation is somewhat tedious it's about commuting where we would love to do something else whether it's watching a netflix show or prepping for the meeting right it's how do we claim back that time and how do we do it in a safe way but i wanted to i just wanted to go back because you actually asked a a a really good question before which was about we sort of this robo taxi thing it's um it's a it's a something out in the future and it's also a moving goalpost um it's the two main components of how do we get there is technology that kind of just solves itself over time. And then it's the behavior. Can we sort of convince me and my mom to go in that car? That's a slight question mark maybe. And then it's obviously also just around the the actual legislation on it. Like when will cities actually allow this? But if we go back in time, so to the now and look at, can we solve some of the sustainability problems or some of the other big problems with what we have right now? And and that I think is interesting. And that sort of at least pertains to some of the stuff that we are doing here at Deem. So what I mentioned in the beginning is that to, to me, to us, one of the largest problems we have in the world right now with transportation is that, again, 80% of all mile, miles traveled, it's more than that, by the way, in the US, are done in private cars. How can we give folks an alternative to private cars? Now, we can't do that always. Most people will still want to own a vehicle. But for some of their commutes, um, some of their business trips, some of their leisure trips, are there more efficient, that could be cost efficient ways or more sustainable ways that we can give, give to them. And the answer obviously is that we're seeing electrification of private vehicles right now. So that's accelerating pretty fast, which is really great to see. One of the one of the things that we see is um, there's obviously it's it's still expensive to buy an electric vehicle. There's still a lot of misconceptions around electric vehicles, uh, you know, uh, range anxiety, that kind of stuff, right? If you don't have to own the vehicle, but you just have access to it, the, the sort of the whole concept around mobility as a service, then you don't have to worry about range anxiety. And that's obviously rental cars, right? You don't own them, you just get them and then you go kind of from A to B and then that's it, you pick it up, it's the tr- it's full, the, it's fully charged and um, you know, there's a routing on it, it shows you where to charge and two days later you drop it and, and hopefully you have a good experience. Same thing if you look at Ride Hill, uh, one of the interesting things that uh, Uber has done, uh, which, and we work um, with Uber on this, um, is A, they have a, a sort of a product which is a, a green version of their Ride Hill. So if you sort of if you click that that button on the Ride Hill app, you'll get a hybrid or an electric vehicle. So I know a hybrid is still a gas engine with a tiny little battery on top. It's really just a gas engine, slightly better gas engine, but it's still it's still it's still better. And real electric cars have mixed in. the The really I think cool thing is that they now have price parity. So it basically means that you can book an Uber Green for the same cost as if you're booking a fully uh, 
uh, petrol powered and ICE Uber. And now even in some cities, they have pure EV categories. So pick that and then you'll be, you know, uh, Tesla Model 3 or Ford mach -E or uh, something like that, a Polestar 2 will come and pick you up. So basically that sustainability choice you can immediately make. And just to tie a bow around that whole thing, the reason, so we, uh, the company I work for, we, we do corporate travel. So our customers are Fortune 500 companies and, you know, they have anything, anywhere from a couple of thousand employees up to, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees. And when I think about the impact that we can have, it's obviously if we can give these companies uh, an interface, an app, a website, when they travel around the world, and they have to make the decision of going from A to B, from hotel to airport. If we can uh, nudge them over to a sustainable option, right? So an electric rental car or light rail or an electric Uber, for instance, instead of the equivalent um, sort of gas, non-sustainable mode of transportation, we immediately impact a lot of employees. Um, and we do it in the in the space of mobility as a service, as in you do not, as a family, have to go out and purchase this mode. You just have access to it. And that I think is really interesting. Yeah, that that cer certainly is. You know, I'm I'm reminded that uh, in our work here at ARC, we're we're often looking at you know when is the inflection point on vehicle pe personal passenger vehicle electrification, and we know it's not terribly far off when the cost of the electric vehicle cost per mile total cost of ownership is actually below that of an internal combustion engine vehicle right. um, and arguably we may be at that point but the general market hasn't may not have perceived that um you know in some applications we're certainly there um, yeah there, there, there are there are there are some jurisdictions in the u.s that do have uh, tesla police cars because they see the cost per mile uh, i've that. seen that it's fascinating isn't it yeah yeah it, it really is but i'm i'm wondering and uh I've been uh, interested and perplexed a bit by your um, by your comment that there's a swiftly changing culture around travel. Uh, can you expand upon that a little bit? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by my, well, my comment around travel? What specific? Well, you're, yes, it, it's about you, you. You've commented that there's a swiftly changing culture around travel. Um, is that is that people traveling more? um being more comfortable with different modes no i think i think my point is that um we we as a booking platform we're we're gateway to modes of mobility we're an interface we're mid-layer for corporate travelers to to different modes of mobility and um about a third of all travel in the world is business travel and business travelers are um they're less um they're sort of because you're not traveling on your own dime um you 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 sometimes then have sort of more more modes more options um for you right so um we just think that there is to, to me the most important thing when i sort of wake up in the morning around this whole mobility space and game it's how do we move the needle the most? And I think that there is an opportunity to um, change the behavior of um, a lot of folks by giving them both more convenient modes, but but really more sustainable modes. No, agreed, agreed. And it's not all about autonomous or or even vehicle electrification. You know, one technology that um, I'm quite um, uh, enthused by is simply connected vehicle technology uh 802.11p for those uh, uh geeks out there um and it it's a 100 meter point-to-point -point protocol uh with very low latency so that well basically in, in a layman's terms each vehicle cannot occupy uh someone else's location their gps space uh, mm -hmm. That protocol is already in phone, in, in your phone. It's not hasn't been turned on. But this way, even ICE vehicles can aggregate as a little fleet going down the road and can talk to that traffic signal and turn it green. Or the traffic signal alternately can say, you're a little bit too far away. Um, let me take over and take your foot off 
the accelerator pedal, and you can just coast in at an at an echo rate. And they they even have a terminology there for those ICE vehicles as um, they call it echo drive. If there if there is that that uh, dynamic interaction between the traffic signal and the and the ICE um, vehicle, um, but more importantly, it also it also drives that quality of life and safety issue for the pedestrian, where your car will know in the relatively near future, maybe before um, autonomous vehicles are ubiquitous, that you are in the crosswalk and that vehicle will not will not allow itself to to impact you. Right, right. I mean, yeah, you're t- again, it's back to this thing of it's obviously, you know, your podcast, it's a smart city, smart road, smart crosswalk. Um, there is a world in the future where we probably will want all of these vehicles in some shape or form uh, to communicate together. And I mean, it's it's interesting. I, mean, I, was, I was driving back from from L.A. to San Francisco last night and took a bit of a detour up the Pacific Coast. So it took a very long time. But it is fascinating driving on a six lane, five lane, four lane, whatever it is, highway. And look how inefficiently the humans operate those highway systems. Right. So it is it's a complete free fall, whether or not someone is on the left side, the right side. It's completely random who's going five miles faster, five miles slower. And the amount of space these humans inside of the, the vehicle sort of take up on these highways is just phenomenal. And when you start uh, getting to a world where we can, and again, robo taxis are not, but at least we can have these sort of vehicles start talking to each other. And as you said, either roll through, I was about to say red lights, you can remove the red lights or uh, you can sequence the red light based on traffic flows, et cetera. Um, you can start having uh, both safer, but also way more um, efficient flows of traffic. You know, purely, purely from a from a financial standpoint, the the you know the well a, a new vehicle today in the U.S. is I think the average price is thirty seven, thirty eight, forty thousand dollars. It's and going the, up quickly, by the way. But uh, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, and the if you can get one, and the utilization yeah. rate is is very low. I mean, and that's when you really think about it. For those that don't work at home, that's that's uh or even or even worse if you do, that's a very pricey asset to sit in your driveway or in your garage or in in your you know condominium parking lot. It is, um, and that's. And it, it, you're hitting the nail on the head. The problem is there's no alternative. It's coming, but it's very difficult to find an alternative. So the cars parked on average in the world, these 1.4 billion cars, they're parked, you know these numbers, right? It's 95% of the time they sit still. When they drive, they have you and then half a passenger. So average occupancy in private owned vehicles at 1.5. It, it it really is ridiculous. And then when they're driving on the road, they're talking about humans who are not the best at driving, right? So um, there is there's so much uh, there's so much to gain by improving that. But the problem right now, obviously, is that we 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 have to have these cars because we it really only if you live in big cities that have really great subway systems or um, you know where sort of the cost of a ride hill, for instance, is very, very low and, and, and the reliability of them are very high, then you have a true alternative. But um, if you sort of model it up, if you look at the cost per mile for a ride hill or say a taxi, they're not too far from each other, and then map that up against um, sort of your your um, the cost per mile for private car ownership, even if that car sits still most of the time, that, that sort of dormant Toyota Camry out in the garage is still a heck of a lot cheaper uh, than doing ride hill, which is why you can't rely on an average family can't do ride hill as their commute, right? They can't do it for shopping and can't do it for weekends and so on. So that, that's really, that's why we keep talking about, again, that flag on the moon, the robo taxi stuff, when we sort of can, when you remove the human driver and you hopefully with some kind of legislation say, in order for these um, vehicles or pods or shuttles to operate in the city, they have to be shared. We have to have two, three people sitting in them. When you get to that point, you drop the price per mile for a, a robo shuttle down to the cost of public transportation. And that's the inflection point. That's when everything changes. 
you know, Nicola, let me ask an uncomfortable, inconvenient question, perhaps, is that, you know, public transportation in the U.S. is heavily subsidized. Do you see the same scenario having to play out for what arguably or probably will be privately owned shuttle systems? So I think the way you probably have to do this is at some point you want to, and you see this in Europe in some cities, you want to start carving out car-free zones in cities. So you already have congestion charge, right? So it costs something to drive in the city. That's a way of obviously limiting the amount of miles driven by uh, private-owned cars in cities. And then at some, the next level after that is that you basically shut off part of the inner city. But folks still need to be able to move around. So what's the alternative? There's no alternative right now because public transportation is just not convenient enough um, it's on a fixed route. It's on a fixed schedule that doesn't really f fit your route and your schedule. But when you move into that robo taxi future, it's you know it's completely dynamically routed and is completely on demand. Um, but what happens if you if if you sort of can't afford it, right? If you, if you relied on that sort of very cheap one thousand dollar car to take you to and from work, which a lot of people do, that's when you need to move into something that's subsidized. So. Uh, I think to your point, that's probably what you want to do. You probably for a certain income level, you probably want to subsidize access to public transportation. And I want to call it quasi or hyper public transportation, which is what I would view robo taxis having to be in the future. Um, and then other people have higher income sales, they'll, they'll pay um, they'll pay the full price. OK, well, well uh, that, that, that leads to somewhat of a, a broader question um, is, you know, private versus public mobility as a service. Yeah, um, is that. Um, do you see it just being an issue of subsidization for lower income uh, um, strata or are, are, are there other creative combinations there that might result? Well, I, th I think so. I think one important thing probably um, that you and I can agree on is that, again, robo taxis are not the solution to everything. Robo taxis are probably the solution to getting rid of car ownership. And when I say get rid of, maybe some folks will be like, but I want to own my car and I'm, you know, that's probably fine, but you probably don't want to because it's going to be so much cheaper, so much safer for your children. Um, you can work from the, from the car and so on, or from the shuttle that you probably want to do that just out of sheer, again, economic sense or safety and so on. But if you look at the public transportation system, so whether it's fast rail, whether it's subway, et cetera, um, when done right, those modes are so much more efficient in moving large amounts of people back and forth in a city. So those, the, these two, it's not an either or, um, it's, it's definitely a sense of we still want and need to have public transportation system. We still need to improve them, but we'll probably have this future where they will be very much collaborating with the, with a, almost like a per invite basis, the private operators. And to your point again, public transportation is subsidized. To some extent, we probably want to look at potentially if we're telling people you can't drive your car in this five by five mile uh, square anymore in the city. Uh, we and if we need to, if we want to make sure that we have social mobility, as in everyone can actually go back and forth, the kind of like democratization of mobility. Um, we have to look at subsidizing or moving some of the subsidizing off of uh, into these kind of hybrid quasi uh, robo public networks. Well, cer certainly, because in the I mean, today we have instances where Lyft and Uber are actually the contracted providers for last mile, first mile and last mile service to light rail stations and yeah. And suburban state train stations that might go to an inner inner city as well. That's so that's already already happening. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because right now, and it's 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 even more apparent in 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 um, in Europe, you have uh, public transit agencies that are trying to or that need to serve communities where the traffic patterns are very light. You basically have uh, buses where you can have 20 or 30 people sitting in and you have one or two people in them, which is, you know, they're just huge. Some of the routes are, are, are huge uh, uh, losses for them. And to your point, they're doing a, a dynamic routed on demand type system in collaboration with an Uber or Lyft can make a lot more 
financial sense and it can and it can actually be a better experience um, for for the actual traveler as well. Yeah, certainly here here in North America, particularly in in the, in the U.S., it's the first mile, last mile problem that gets an awful lot of attention. How do I get my? In, well, typically it's been my private car to the train station, and and there there are no parking spaces for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, typically that's that's what you see. Um, well, that that leads me to to another question that I think you've spoken about in the past, which is you know micro mobility rather than just just autonomous mobility. But how does that help cities? I mean, from a from a footprint standpoint, I don't know how many of the listeners, but you can maybe you can use Google while you're while you're listening right now. If you Google footprint of a bus versus footprint of a car, you a lot of a lot of uh, uh, sort of different blogs have done these pictures of uh, you take 100 people or 200 people and you show the the amount of area they take up if they're just on, on, on if they're just walking then they have the same picture of them on the bike and then they have the same picture of them in a bus and then the same picture of them in a car and you just see how that geographical footprint just shoots up as we start moving into the cars so um it, it, you know i as i mentioned in the beginning i'm i'm you know i, I come from a, a a biking country i'm an avid biker here in san francisco as well but <laughs> there are definitely certain areas I don't bike or there are definitely certain areas where I don't take an e-scooter because I, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to survive the day. I want to make it home. So, uh, you know, it's, if you've ever tried to bike in downtown Manhattan and you sort of see the bike lanes there, which, and I'm trying to do the air quotes with bike lanes because it's literally, you pay, it's, you painted the picture of a bike lane on a road. But you still have a four four lane avenue with SUVs <laughs> going going 50 miles an hour. You don't want to ride your bike next to that. So um, it's super efficient moving in a city, depending on what city it is, obviously. But it it can be very efficient moving by foot or by a bike, e bike, e scooter, um, all those kind of micro mobility options. But the city in itself needs to be needs to facilitate that, right? It needs to be safe for that. Um, and then yes. and then. The the density you you brought to mind for me a uh, an application that uh, Google maybe you may be able to find this, but um, going back to my connected vehicle um, app, um, technology um, uh, application, I know there is a study out there of if you were to use connected vehicle technology on the buses going through the Lincoln Tunnel over to the Port Authority bus station in Manhattan, and they were able to travel five feet apart rather than hundreds of feet apart as they currently do in that bus lane, you would quickly mm -hmm. overwhelm the Port Authority bus station with customers. And you, the, the the hurdle would then be how do you circulate the buses around downtown Manhattan back out back out the Lincoln or Holland Tunnel. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's um it, it's going to be an interesting world moving forward. It is, it is. And I will say I you know I, I think about that when I see uh, American cities most American cities are, they're very much built for the car. So I think as we think about micro mobility in a sort of a US context versus other cities, it's really about, as to your point, Jim, the density of the city. So um, we're, it's, it's, it's this balance between what's the convenience uh, you still need, you still want to get from A to B as fast as you possibly can. That's the convenience factor, right? But then at the same time, you also want to do it in a, in a way where it's sort of um, it's not optimizing for you, you and just yourself. You're not just an island in that city, right? You want to optimize for the entire city. So we don't have a city of eight and a half million people trying to get from A to B in the same piece of metal, which happens to be a car. Then nobody wins, right? Um, so uh, depending on what kind of city it is, what the how, what the density of the city is and so on, you can basically sort of think of multimodal mobility from feet to flight, you know, the the cars in the middle, the micro mobility in the middle, the in the middle, the subways, the buses, the, the trains, and so on, as different types of tools for the job. And if we can find a way for that to be uh, operated in a more sort of um, in a way where it doesn't optimize for um, individuals or private companies' profit, but it optimizes for all of our convenience, all of our safety, and the livability of the city, that's you know, that's probably the way to go. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, 
If you were to ask me about the future, I do see a scenario. Clearly, the modes of transportation will only continue to increase, and the options of how you select that will increase. And you may you may purchase by speed, by by reduction of CO2 emissions, um, or or maybe taking the scenic route. There there may be a number of of sliders there on your on your options, and and I would expect it 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 wouldn't be just one one um, uh, data provider that you that you may go to. Do you, do you think do you do you think at some point we'll see the first cities almost doing a I don't even know what we'd call it but some almost like a CO2 sustainability quota that kind of says Jim <laughs> you've traveled too much and too many big cars this month you're out of credit so it's it's e-scooters and walking and electric vehicles from here do you think like we'll get to a point where we'll kind of have cities, transit agencies interfering, if you want to call it that, that much, or trying to at least sort of nudge, legislate around what the behavior in the city is? Uh, it, it, that is, that, that's a, that's a million dollar question. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of a recent uh, World Economic Foundation um, Forum um, presentation where they asked about ESG rating and, and how many there are, in particular about how um, you know, Tesla was not on the S&P 500 any longer, uh, ESG, S&P 500. I know, I know. I was shaking and, my head when I read that. That's another I forget, conversation. And, and, and the comment, I, I forget who the CEO was, but it was of a consumer um, goods manufacturer. And he said, don't worry, Elon Musk, there's only 14 major ESG rating, rating agencies out there. And they all weight <sighs> all the different aspects very differently. So... It really depends. The yeah. weighting, the, the the weighting in say uh, you know San Jose or San Francisco is probably going to be different than it is in Houston, Texas. I mean, I guess to some some extent, just to answer my own question, I wouldn't know how to answer. It, by the way, that's why I, I was trying to ask you. But okay. I guess like <laughs> I guess cities. I mean, cities are already interfering, right? And I mean, when I say interfering, I actually mean that in a positive way. But if if you look at um, street closures, right? Um, you know, shutting down streets, doing pedestrian walkways and, and, and that kind of stuff. There's a lot going on in Barcelona in Spain right now, in Paris and France, Oslo, Norway, a bunch of European cities where they're, um, uh, they're basically shutting down the roads for, um, for, for vehicle traffic and uh, turning them into these, I think, really cool, green, walkable areas. And so the neighborhoods are not this, oh, I'm walking out on the street and I immediately have to watch for cars and uh, the sound and the you know the smell and all that stuff, but it's, it's literally green walkways instead, which I think is pretty incredible. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, there there we're all well aware that many you know many cities have been um, very challenged by tourism and in particular cars, and they're doing a a much better job of of um, managing that, whether it be Amsterdam or or Venice. Or, or even here where I am in Florida, St. Augustine or, or, or Key West. You know, that, that tourism aspect um, and the transportation that requirements that come along with it are, are often a heavy lift, um, particularly as, as business interests um, you know, attempt to continue the growth of, the, of that industry in a particular you know, uh, domain that might be a bit, a bit delicate and small for that matter. Yeah, I just want to, I don't want to, uh, this to be a sales pitch, obviously, so I'll try to undersell it. But I think that's one of the things we think about in, again, in our world of business travel. Um, you know, we, I think, as to your point, you know, in your locality where you live, Jim, like, what's a good way of, of traveling around? And I know here in San Francisco, like, what are good ways to travel around? And um, I know where I can walk to, I know where I can take sort of, you know, the bar to, I know when I need to take my vehicle and so on. But when we travel, so if you go to Berlin in Germany, and I try to tell, I ask you like, what's the best way to get from Tiergarten, which is their big park in the middle of the city, and then out to Schönefeld Airport? Like, what's the best way of doing that? What's drive time? And you need to make the flight at 1 p.m. Like, you probably don't know that, right? I mean, I don't know that. So um, I think if we can, one again, one thing is the the the, lo the local community travel um, that we need to solve, but. Um, one of the things that we think about is business travelers as they travel around and travel to new cities um, in the U.S. or outside of the U.S., 
how can we help them uh, make better choices? And when I say better choices, it's really about not just cost control because you know they have travel manager wanting to make sure they don't run out of budget, but it's really about the sustainability piece. How can we get them into light rail instead of a car? How can, if they need a car, how can we help them get an electric car um, you know, instead of a, instead of a gas, a gas car, or, um, how can we maybe, um, make sure they don't need to drive and then park, but that, you know, they can do a rental car combined with a ride hill or whatever it might be. So that, that's very much how we, you know, we think about multimodal mobility when people travel. And also we, there's sort of this notion of virtual interlining, which is when you combine different modes, it's what you mentioned earlier as well. The first mile, last mile, right? So you walk to the subway and then you take the subway somewhere else, and then you might get on a plane. That's three modes that are virtually inclined together. You're doing that right now in your head. So that's your little tech computer that sort of stitches it together. But it's kind of, wouldn't it be nice if you're in Shanghai that you had a some kind of app app thing that told you this is the best way to virtual inline your trip when accounting for safety, um, time, cost, and sustainability, for instance. You beat me to that question. I, I was going to ask about the, the other attributes beyond sustainability in a, in a travel planning platform. And of course, you know, one of the most um, troublesome ones is predictability, particularly when it's uh, not your own car. You know, one of the main, main reasons to drive your own car is I know when I'm going, going to get there. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's a good point. And uh, so, yeah, one of the things we're looking at right now is, um, again, we're, we're a business travel platform. And as such, we typically have travelers, um, or not typically, we, we have travelers booking their flights and their hotels in this platform. That's a, those are geo locations, right? So that means we have an airport in the beginning and an airport in the end, and then we have a hotel in the middle. And then the technology, the prediction can actually basically compute that entire journey for you and saying, well, we know home address, departure airport, destination airport, hotel in the middle, and then vice versa, the, the, the reverse, right? Going back, let's try to just compute that. So you basically have, to your point, a bunch of attributes time, cost, sustainability, convenience, safety, maybe they're more. Um, and then you can almost look at them as like little levers you could sort of pull up and now and say, yeah, I really want to skew this all the way over in sustainability. And I have a lot of time, so don't worry about how quickly this happens and then give me the best possible route. But you could also flip it around, right? And say, I need to get there as fast as possible and home as fast as possible to my family. Show me what the best options are. Virtual interline this for me. Nicola, that, that really is fascinating. And, and, I, and I have to tell you that this has been an intriguing, uh, almost an hour speaking with, uh, again, N Nikolai Koster of DEEM, uh, Head of Mobility at, at DEEM, a travel planning platform. Um, Nikolai, are there, are there any last uh, comments you have for our audience as we're nearing the end of our episode today? I just want to say that if you're not driving an electric vehicle right now, I think uh, go, go, uh, go try I'm sure you have a friend or a friend of a friend who has an electric vehicle. Go out and try them. I'm still fascinated by how far we've come the last couple of years with electric vehicles. I drove our own electric vehicle again from LA to San Francisco yesterday, and um, such an enjoyable experience. I'm just, I'm just, I'm happy. I'm just, I'm such a technology person, naive technology person. I'm just happy we have this tech under our feet right now. And back to your point earlier about the price parity. I mean, if if you're in the market for a vehicle that's anything above 40, 40,000, something like that, um, there's no reason not to pick an electric vehicle today. If you look at total cost of ownership, especially with gas prices going up, if you're under that, maybe have a look at the the used car EV market. You probably have to wait a bit for it. But it, to me, that makes me happy. Um, that's kind of like the first order of business in this future mobility is let's try to get these 1.4 billion cars um, electrified as quickly as possible. I think that we're, we're seeing some really good steps on that in the market. That's right. That's great. You know, Nicola, I'll even expand upon that a, a little bit more. I mean, I'm here in South Florida with, you know, warm weather and, uh, you know, we don't have rainstorms for, for days on end at, at any rate, but we do see a profusion of electric golf carts and particularly electric bicycles. For and people, you know, go to the supermarket half a mile away or two miles away and they'll that's what they'll use. That's awesome. That's well, I, we don't. I mean, we obviously a couple of the right. There are a couple of obviously e-bike companies as well. But um, to your point, like even also, you know, sort of privately owned e-bikes. E-bikes are really great these days. Um, 
good low price point and they go really far. They're easy to charge. Um, it, that is a good mode of mobility. Yeah, I mean, I'll 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 leave with a, with an anecdote that my my, my nephew who had a F two fifty Super Duty sold it and he for uh, he works <laughs> in a surf shop and he sold him an e bike at, uh, at at a discounted e bike and he loves his e bike. <laughs> Wow. Give him, give him my regards. I love that. Yeah. And he doesn't have to pay for parking because he can run it right into the store. Well, again, I'm sure he um, paid like I'm sure he paid for two parking spots before. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Nikolai, this is this has been fascinating, truly, truly fascinating. Um, lastly, if someone wants to uh, reach out to you, can you give us some of your uh, contact information? Um, yeah, um, I am on um, I'm obviously on LinkedIn. So um if uh, if you look me up on LinkedIn or um, or obviously also feel free to uh, to shoot me an email um, if you're dropping that in the description, um, folks are uh, very welcome to reach out to me. Love to chat. Great, great. Well, well, one, once again, our our, our guest today um, has been Nikolai Koster, uh, head of mobility at Deem, a travel planning platform, and it's been uh, just just a thrill to have him today. Thank you, Nikolai, and thank you to everyone who's been listening in today. Take care. Everybody. Thanks for having me, Jim. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities.